Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 1 16th scale radio controlled M1A2 Abrams. The model that you see here was built for a private commission and belongs to a private collector. As I often mention in these videos, I often take on commission built projects from models ranging from 1 35th scale all the way up to 1 6th scale. As for availability and pricing information, that information would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. The model in this video here started off as a pre-built 1 16th scale M1A2 Abrams from Hen Long. The model has since undergone a lot of modifications as well as detail upgrading to bring the model up to the specs that you see here. We'll be going over these additions and modifications in this video. Here are some photographs of the model just prior to the start of the build in order to get an idea on what the base starter model looks like and supplied you with. The model comes again just like any other hand long tank, pre-built and pre-painted. This version here did have some rudimentary airbrushing on it to simulate weathering. And the model also supplies you with a few runners of detail components that are simple plug and play onto the model surface. This Abrams kit here is a relatively new release by Han Long. They also released a few other modern main battle tanks, including a Chinese ZTZ, as well as even a Challenger 2. I'll be going over more of the mechanical systems towards the end of the video with an actual test drive. However, the model is powered with a 2.4 GHz radio. And underneath the hood, the model is completely stock with all the stock sound effects and the stock gearbox as well as all the other stock electronics. Again, more information on that will come towards the end of the video. From what I have seen on the market, this model here is the second M1A2 Abrams that is represented in 116 scale. The other model is from Hubin, who we all know from the T55 as well as the elephant kits that are floating around. I can't really comment on the Hooven kit as I've yet to build one, however from the photographs I've seen of the model, that model also appears to be a nicely done rendition as well. However, one caveat with the Hooven is that the Hooven model is an all unassembled plastic model kit, while this one here is technically quote unquote a pre-built. The Hooven model is also a little bit difficult to track down compared to the Henlong offering. With the Hooven, you're going to have to go to their website direct to purchase it, while the Henlong is far more abundant and prolific, and this model here can be acquired from eBay as well as even Amazon.com. The overall appearance of the model seems to be very well done. The tank does appear to be 116 scale, and everything seems to be to their proper proportions and size. As you can see, the tank itself is a very large model for a 116 scale tank. It's actually quite difficult even to get it all in frame on my usual filming surface. Being a modern MBT, it is similar in scale and size to the Tamiya Leopard 2 to put things in perspective. First, let's take a quick walk around the model. This vehicle here really doesn't need an introduction. However, for all those who have been living under a rock, the vehicle here is the American M1A2 Abrams. This vehicle here is the current main battle tank of both the United States Army as well as the United States Marine Corps. The vehicle is also sold to export countries and is seen service in a number of countries around the world. The M1 Abrams family itself starts back into the late 1970s and was really a development from the failed MBT-70 project. In the 1980s, the XM1 design was approved and entered service as the M1 Abrams. Since that time, the vehicle has undergone several improvements and modifications compared to its original release. The first time the M1 family saw combat was in the Gulf War in 1990 and has served in every single conflict which the United States has deployed to since then, most recently of course being the Iraq War. The vehicle, when it first entered service back in the mid-1980s, was originally armed with a 105mm L7 main gun. In the 
late 80s and into the early 90s, the L7 was switched with that of the Rheinmetall 120 mm smoothbore main gun. This main gun was found on the M1A1 and carried over into the M1A2 and as by looks of it has no replacement in sight. The vehicle is also armed with two 7.62 mm M240 machine guns, one in the coaxial position and the second on the loader's hatch. The vehicle is also armed with a standard M2 HB 50 caliber machine gun for the tank commander. The tank is powered by a single jet turbine engine, which is located in the rear and is connected to transmission via power pack. The jet engine was one of the more unique features found on the Abrams and has been carried over and not changed since the inception of the project. The tank can go very fast, however, there is a governor chip on the inside to keep the, the speed at a constant 40 miles an hour as a top speed. Any faster and excessive wear is added to the tracks and running gear. The current M1A2 weighs in around 65 or so tons. To put things in perspective, this is similar in weight to the World War II German King Tiger. The M1 has a great service history and doesn't look like it's going to be replaced with anything in U.S. military service for the foreseeable future. Starting with the model suspension, the model, like all Henlong models, feature a spring functional suspension. The suspension system is very strong and does do a very good job at holding up the weight of the model. The actual suspension components are stock in that the swing arms as well as the row wheels are made out of plastic. The rubber tires that you see here are painted and weathered to replicate that of rubber. Now I do believe on the aftermarket scene there are replacement metal road wheels with real rubber tires as well as I also believe metal torsion bar swing arms themselves. One modification that I made to the road wheels was that I went ahead and replaced the stock Henlong hubcaps. The kit does supply you with a set of hubcaps, however the hubcaps are made out of standard plastic. One unique feature about the M1 Abrams is that the hubcaps are not made out of metal or a type of opaque polymer. Instead, the hubcaps are actually made of clear plastic. The reason for the clear plastic is so the crewman can see how much oil is left on the axles in case more lubricant needs to be added. The versions that you see here are a new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com product line. They are a set of clear resin hubcaps. The set is designed for the Henlong tank and is a drop-in installation. You just swap out the opaque plastic ones for the clear resin ones. When it comes time for painting, you paint the stem of the hubcap and the center fastener, leaving the face of the hubcap in its natural clear resin. Before I went ahead and added the hubcaps, a, a quick mod that I made was that I went ahead and removed all the road wheels. One feature that I like on this model is that the road wheels are held on with a single Phillips screw. If you take off the screw, the entire road wheel slips off the swing arm. This is a great advantage for a rebuild in that you, it's easy to paint the row wheels once everything is off the model, as well as even getting paint into the lower extremities of the hull, which generally is pretty tricky to do on build model tanks. While the row wheels were off, I also took the time to add a little smear grease on each of the swing arm axles, which makes helps the row wheel mount on easier and also prolongs its service life. As for the fastener, when the fastener was reinstalled I also used red Loctite in order to keep everything firmly in place. In addition to the road wheels, red Loctite was also used on the fasteners for the gearbox. This is another trait that is typically done on my 116 builds. Another addition that was added to the model which cannot really be seen on these scenes here is that beneath the 
side skirts. On the real M1 Abrams, there are mounting components for mounting on the side skirts to the vehicle. These components emerge from the side of the hull. Also found on the side of the hull are bump stops, which prevent the swing arm from overstretching. These details are absent and are omitted on the Henlong model. The model that you see here has these details that have been added. You can see them below in the below photographs. The details are a new rest and set from EastCoastArmory.com and contain all the components for the mounting of the fasteners as well as the swing arm stops. These components here are purely for detail purposes only and are non-functional. One caveat to the addition of these components is that by adding these parts on, it does increase the fragility of the model. This is important in case if anyone is a hardcore runner of these tanks and likes to run these tanks on really rough terrain, namely with debris that can easily be caught up into the track area. These, com th these detail resting parts may not be a good fit for this type of running operation. However, if anyone is building an M1 and they want to replicate with the one or two side screw panels removed, this detail set is definitely recommended. While on the front, one addition that I made to the model was I modified the molded in footman loop, which you see here found on the front fender. The Abrams does have this distinctive little loop here in order for the crew member to go ahead and climb onto the vehicle. The stock model does have this piece present and it is a simple molded in little piece of material. On the real M1 Abrams, this component here is actually made of a steel cable. On the model here, I went ahead and deleted the plastic molded inversion. In its place, I replaced it with, again, a real steel cable. The cable was fabricated and then mounted to two holes that were drilled into the mounts that were present on the fender. This is a mirror image on the opposite side of the model. Moving towards the front return roller, the return roller on the original model was actually made out of die cast metal and had real rubber tires. The version that you see here is actually an aftermarket set that came with the sprocket set, which I'll be going over in the next scene. The upgraded version is still made out of die cast and does have rubber tires for the wheels, which is a nice touch. One, one improvement that the aftermarket version had compared to the kit original was that the aftermarket is actually ball bearing assisted, as opposed to the stock version, which is your standard bushing style system which is found on other Henlong models. Moving our way to the drive sprocket, like I said before, the sprockets were swapped out on the model. The original model did feature a pretty decent pair of metal drive sprockets. The reason why they were replaced was because the original metal drive sprockets did not have the mud holes, which are a very important feature found on post-war American tanks. The mud holes that you see here are present on the aftermarket versions, and the aftermarket versions are a drop-in replacement and are assembled very easily. Moving our way to the tank's tracks, the tracks are another bit of detailing which were swapped out from the kit original. The original kit tracks I have right here. The stock tracks were actually not too bad. They're actually made out of metal and do have some decent detailing on them, which is present on the surface. The reason why they were replaced with the aftermarket ones is if we could see here on the Abrams, the pads found on the face of the track are actually made of rubber. This is very standardized on American tanks and is found on just about all American tanks dating all the way back to World War II. In addition to the rubber, which would be rubber on the face of the track, the inside of the track portion on the stock track does not have any of its internal pad detailing present. As you can see, it's just a hollow cavity. The tracks that you see here are an aftermarket set that were acquired off of eBay along with the sprocket and the return roller. The metal tracks that were acquired are, like I said, made of metal and they do feature rubber pads on the face and more importantly rubber pads found on the interior portion of the track. The track components were painted with their appropriate colors for the medium that they're represented in, namely a parkerized finished for the metal components and the rubber pads were left with their black coloring without any paint added. In addition to just the 
the pads, the only addition that was made paint-wise was a simple bit of weathering done to the rubber portions of both the interior and exterior portions of the track. While on the back, you can see that this tank here is missing its rear portion of the side skirt detailing. The side skirt detailing was present, and this tank does have the M1A2 or M1A1 style of rear fender, which has a cutout here in the back for that of the drive sprocket. One of the requirements of the customer for this build was to have these pieces deleted and removed. The components were amputated and the remnants were then polished away with that of bodywork. This is one mod that is commonly seen on tanks in field is the replacement of this component here, more than likely due to the lack of access to the sprocket with the fender present. In addition to that, there's also more than likely a chance of debris being kicked up by the track, which can in turn damage the fender, just causing a bunch of problems. Moving our way to the back of the vehicle, takes us to first the engine grates. If we notice here on all the engine grates, I went ahead and fabricated the missing hinge pin detailing, which would have been found on the real tank and was absent on the model. Also, the small little hooks and axis hatches were another addition that were absent on the model and were fabricated. One interesting feature of this exhaust on this tank is if we notice this portion here of the exhaust manifold is painted in a black coloring. The On the M1 Abrams, the jet exhaust is actually found on the center portion of the grill here. And I have seen several tanks coming out of the Anderson Army Depot with this portion here painted in black. If anyone knows for the reason for that, feel free to put that in the comment section below. Also, if we notice the to give some visual difference between the weathering of the exhaust as the compared to the standard color of the other manifold, two shades of black were utilized in order to give the contrast required to have the piece with its weathering. While on the back of the model, the model here does have a smoke system present, and the smoke system is your standard hand long puffing unit. In order to refill the smoke system, it is very easy to do on this tank and easier compared to all the other 116s that I've recently completed. On this version here, there are two small holes which are found on the opposite side of this little frame. These two holes, which are under here, are where the smoke actually emits from the model. Now unlike other 116 models in which I've had to come up with some kind of a plumbing system for refueling of the system, on this tank here it's not necessary. You simply take the, the model supplied smoke fluid with its long thin nozzle and you simply put it into one of the exhaust holes and you inject the fluid directly into the system. Moving our way back to the front of the model takes us to the bow toe eye areas. The model does have its toe eyes present on the kit, which is a nice touch. On the model, however, the toe eyes are just simply solid without their holes present. With a Dremel and a drill bit, this was a very quick addition to add, which does help the look of the model. This, these two details are also present on the back portion of the rear of the model, and again, the same procedure was done with the Dremel and the drill bit. Moving our way up to the model's deck, first takes us to the small little grab handle. This is just like with the footman loop found on the Abrams in order to help the crew members get onto the tank. Now this handle here is only found on this side of the tank and is present on the stock model. However, on the stock model, instead of it being an actual handle, it's a blade of plastic. To improve the detailing, this blade was removed. In its place, a metal wire handle was fabricated. The metal handle does help the look of the model. Moving from the handle takes us to the bow driver's hatch. As you can see, there are three periscope positions found on the Abrams bow hatch. Now the hatch itself is stock and is molded into the hull and does not open. One piece of detailing that is lacking on this model, however, is the lack of periscope inserts on all of the periscopes that are found on this kit. Rather than leaving the gaping holes present, I went ahead and developed a resin drop-in periscope detail insert. 
The component is casted out of clear resin and simply mounts to the hatch by gluing it to the bottom portion of the hull. It slides in and then you have the missing periscope detailing presence. Now if we notice the periscopes themselves are do have a red tint or red hue coloring. The reason for that from my understanding is that to protect the crew from anyone with a laser pointer or any other type of high energy laser, the periscopes have a special type of protective film on them that blocks out the laser light and prevents it from blinding the crew member. This is true for all the periscopes on this model. The resin insert you see here is made out of clear and the red tinting is not present on the resin. To get the d tint that you see here, some transparent red paint was brushed onto the back portion of the clear resin insert, namely the parts that are behind the the lens portion so that once it's installed you have this nice amber coloring that you have here. One very important bit of detailing that was added to this model that was absent on the stock kit and hopefully it comes out in film is that of the textured surface found on the top panels of both the hull and the turret. The M1 Abrams that are currently in use today have a type of non-slip surface that is found on these locations. The purpose of this is that the panels themselves can be slick, specifically when wet or muddy, and the non-slip surface gives some texture that will prevent or help prevent anyone from slipping on this surface here and possibly causing injury. The, this component or this texture I should say is I believe sprayed on and there is a certain mosaic and a certain chart on which portions of the vehicle have this non-slip surface and which don't. These pictures can be found on the internet. As you can see here on the front there is an absence of the non-slip surface found near the bow headlights as well as near where the hatch opens and even on portions near the side skirt. As you can see from the close-ups it's a very nice fine texturing which does make it stand above just leaving it stock. Here's the same texturing added to the rear engine deck as well as on the turret panels themselves. As for how I applied the texturing, that unfortunately is proprietary and I will not be giving that out in this video. Moving on to the rest of the rear deck, you can see the grills are present on the model. The grills themselves are very nicely done by Han Long and were left as is. The only addition that I made of course was with a little bit of black paint. I went ahead and gave them a bit of contrast compared to just leaving them the same color of the model. Moving towards the sides of the turret, first takes us to the tow cables. The tow cables that you see here are a mirror image on the opposite side. The tow cables themselves are made out of a flexible rubbery material and are kit supplied. One addition that I made to the cables, however, was that of the clips. The mounting clips that you see here are made out of pieces of metal strip that were soldered to a peg. The peg then gets mounted to the model and gives it a lot of extra support and structure. Being radio controlled, this is required for more sturdiness and ruggedness of the component. The addition of the clips do help the look of the model compared to just the standard molded in clips which are found on the piece. On the back portion here, there's a small little channel which holds on the tow cable eye, while in the front, there is a small little T clamp in which the eye swivels around and gets locked in place. The channel on the rear was made out of a strip of steel that was bent and shaped to the way you see it. And on the front here, the T is actually fabricated out of a scrap piece of runner that was from one of the 135s that I recently finished. The runner was the appropriate thickness and I found a 
simple T-section, clipped it, and mounted it to the model. Again, this is, a, this is a mirror image on the opposite side. Moving right above the tow cable is a small little thin strip. The strip that you see here is a staple on post-World War II American tanks, namely tanks from the Cold War era. On the real tanks, this strip here is actually a piece of Velcro. The Velcro is found on the turret sides, and I've even seen on some Abrams found on the front portion of the turret as well. This little strip here is missing on the kit and was simply made with a strip of thin styrene. Moving to the front corner portion of the model takes us to a very unique feature found on M1 Abrams, and that here is of the foundry mark, or more, more importantly, the serial number. Now, American tanks always had foundry and casting marks found on components. If anyone's a fan of my 1.6 scale tanks, you'll see the same things on them. However, one thing very unique about the Abrams is that unlike the, the legacy vehicles in which the foundry marks were actually cast into the panel or the, the component, because the Abrams of the method of construction where it's mostly flat plate, the pieces cannot be, the numbers cannot be casted on. And on the Abrams, they actually applied on with that of a welding rod. Now, if you notice here, the numbers are very, very crude and rough in shape. And this is as per the real vehicle, which is funny because the Abrams is such a well-made machine. The, to have the numbers just applied on with just some guy with a welding rod in a very sloppy manner is very interesting. What's also interesting is, as an interesting side note, is that you could tell by the number if the tank was designed for the US military or if it was for export use. And with that designation, you could tell by the letter U that we have here in the prefix. The U, from what I've read on the subject, designates that the, that the turret armor contains depleted uranium inside the Chobham armor. The tanks for export use are missing the depleted uranium. So chances are if you see an M1 Abrams in the news or on the internet and the letter does not have the U in, in this location here, it's an export model. Also what's unique is that this bark or this ID letter here is only found on this corner of the turret. It is not found on the opposite side, and all Abrams have this ID lettering in this position here. Moving our way to the rear bustle bin takes us to the spare tire. Another requirement that the customer had for this build was he wanted to have a spare tire mounted to the rear bustle rack. The spare tire was not included with the Henlong kit. The spare tire that you see here is another new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com product line, and it contains the tire as well as the mounting equipment to mount it to the bustle bin. Now the way the tire is mounted to the bustle bin is actually with that of a spare track tooth. The tooth and the opposite tooth clamp mounts and sandwiches the wheel to the rail of the bustle bin. All of these components are supplied with the set. Moving from the spare tire takes us to the rest of the rear bustle rack. The storage rack that you see here is the kit original one. However, as you can see on the bottom portion, I went ahead and added the meshwork. The meshwork is found on the real M1 Abrams and was not included with the stock Henlong model. For the meshwork itself, I went ahead and utilized this gray plastic mesh. This mesh here was acquired off of eBay and is for train layouts. The weave was a good match for the 116 tank. The mesh was simply cut in shape and then glued in place. Other mods to the rack are as follows. I went ahead and added the hinge pin detailing, which is found on the straps which mount the rack to the turret. Also, on the bottom portion here, you can see the small little eyelets which are found on the bottom portion here of the rack. There are also some found behind the infrared plate. The small little eyelets were made out of small wire that were bent and 
the eyelets were then drilled and mounted to the bottom portion of the rack. It's also important to note that on many current versions of the M1A2, there is an extender rack which comes off of the main rear rack. That rack was not found on the kit and was not fabricated for this build. Moving our way to the tank smoke trajectors, the smoke trajectors that you see on the model here are the kit supply ones and were utilized. The only addition that I made to the, tr to the smoke trajectors was that of the firing cable and plug which you see emerging from the rear of the trajector that goes up to the electrical conduit which is found on the top. This is a mirror image on the opposite side. Moving towards the front of the turret takes us to the infrared identification panels. The panels that you see here are molded into the model, however what was missing were the corner L brackets which are found on these panels. The corner L brackets were made out of very thin strips of sheet styrene. The styrene was clipped and mounted to these locations that you see here. By adding these small little pieces also helps the look compared to the stock original. Moving our way to the tank's mantlet, on the M1 Abrams, the front portion of the mantlet here has these mounts. I believe these mounts are a carryover from the M60 series with that of use of a gun-mounted searchlight. However, I don't believe a searchlight was ever fitted to the M1, but the mounts are still present. The mounts are supplied with the model, and to improve the detail accuracy, I just went ahead and drilled out the mounting holes, which you see here. Moving our way to the tank's coaxial machine gun, the M1 Abrams is distinctive in having its coax machine gun with a large extender shroud mounted over the mantlet. On the real gun, th this portion here are hollow and there's actually strips of steel that run along the tube that keep everything centered. On the headlong model, the tube is a separate piece that plugs directly into the mantlet. It's decently made. However, one mod that I made to it was that due to the way the tube is fabricated, when you plug it into the section here, the small little slits are covered up. On the real gun, these are exposed. And when the gun actually fires, you do see a bit of flash and powder fouling that would build up in this area over time. On the model, to replicate this, I went ahead and with a Dremel, I carefully cut away the portions of the extender tube, which would be exposed at these small little slits. By doing this, when the machine gun fires on the model, you can see some flash emitting from this area over here. Moving our way to the tank's main gun, being an M1A2, the M1A2 Abrams is armed with the 120mm smoothbore Rheinmetall gun. The kit barrel is... Uh, is nicely done. It is the correct size and length, which it was always a problem on some of the older Henlong vehicles. The barrel is made out of good quality material, and one mod that I made was to the small optic, which is found here on the front. If memory serves, I believe this component here is used with bore sighting, in which a crew member would take an optic device, plug it into this location here, and can calibrate the gun in the field. One mod that I made was that on the piece itself, this component here was solid. With a small Dremel bit, I drilled it out, and I inserted a piece of fiber optic to give the look of the optic system. Moving our way to the top of the turret, takes us to first these four mounting fasteners here. These were missing on the kit and were added with, via wire brads. There's four evenly spaced fasteners on either side of the turret. Moving our way to the gunner's optic box, the M1, just like with all American tanks dating back all the way to the Sherman, has a gunner sight which is encased in a protective box. On the M1 Abrams, there are two protective doors which are found on the gunner's box that protect the optic when not in use. On the Henlong model, the piece is made in the closed state that you see here. One simple mod that I made was that I added the missing bit of detailing for the hinge pin and also the small little spring. This is found on both sides of the hatch and when added also really helped kick the model up a few extra notches. Moving along to one of the most distinctive traits on the M1A2 and that is of the CITV optic box. The CITV unit that you see here is supplied with the model, and the model did a decent job with the dimensions as well as the detailing found on the piece. One place that the kit was missing was that of the actual lens, which is found on the face of the optic. Just like with the bow 
periscopes, I went ahead and fabricated a clear resin insert, and this component has also been listed on the EastCoastArmory.com product line. Also, just like with the bow hatch, the lens on the CITV also has its red tinting to it. Continuing along takes us to the tanks antenna bases. The M1 Abrams features a conical shaped spring antenna base. The antenna bases that you see here are a new release from EastCoastArmory.com. The model originally had two metal plugs which were located on either side of the rear turret. The metal plugs are your standard plugs that are found on Henlong models and are intended to be used with a spring coil antenna that is supplied with the kit. These antennas are a carryover from when the Henlong models use a conventional style radio in which you need an external antenna. Because the vehicles are 2.4 gigahertz, that component is no longer necessary. And the stock Henlong unit is very inaccurate in detailing. The kit does supply you with one plastic antenna base, however it's again not necessary to be used on the model as you have two antennas that need to be found. Rather than going ahead and trying to use and modify the kit one, I went ahead and tooled up a new version. The version that you see here, like I mentioned before, are a new release on EastCoastArmory.com and are made out of flexible resin. They do have some flex and pivoting to them, which makes them a lot better for RC use compared to standard solid resin, which can easily snap. The antennas are sold in a set, and you have two in a set plus the wire to equip the tank in the way you see it here. Also, another quick note on the antenna, even though the resin is flexible, it is not nearly as flexible or as rebounding as a standard spring. So flexing the antenna should be done to a minimum. Moving on from the main antenna bases takes us to a secondary antenna location. If we look here on the turret, the I've seen many pictures of the M1 Abrams that utilize a second antenna base, which is found on a column that we have here. This component is absent on the Henlong model and was another new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com product line. It features a set of, that includes the mounting column, as well as a secondary flexible resin spring antenna base. Moving our way to the Tank Commander's cupola, or as I most notably incorrectly pronounce it as copula, the copula that you see here is stock with the Henlong model and does replicate that of an M1A2 copula. There is a difference between the versions from the A2 and the legacy versions of the M1. The hatch that you see here is nicely done in that it is fully articulated and opens up correctly. Just like on all Henlong models, this tank here does have the airsoft BB gun and the hopper to load the BBs is in this copula here. You just drop the BBs in and they'll funnel into their appropriate location. Just like with the other periscopes on the model, the Henlong model stock does not have any inserts. The inserts that you see here are another new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com product line and just like with the other clear resin components, are a clear resin drop and install with again the back portions painted with the red for the red hue that you see here. Moving our way to the tank's loader hatch, the stock kit loader hatch was very basic and was missing a lot of detailing. Rather than utilizing the kit component, I went ahead and tooled up a new loader hatch to the way you see it here. This loader hatch here is another new addition to the EastCoastArmory.com product line and features all of the missing detail that is emitted on the stock hatch, which includes the handle as well as all the other molded and detailing. Some of the other molded and detailing includes that of the periscope, which was also missing on the stock unit, as well as the interior detailing that I have here. The loader's hatch is offered in two separate options. There is the standard opaque resin configuration and there is an all clear version of the hatch. The version on this model here is actually the all clear version. The reason for going with the all clear variant is so then you don't have to paint the periscope insert. Just like with all Henlong models, underneath this hatch here is that of the kill switch for the airsoft gun.
Moving our way to probably the most time consuming and interesting detail of the entire build is that of the tank's M2 HB machine gun. The Henlong model does supply you with the M2. The M2 itself is basically the same type quality found on the other Henlong American tanks. However, it does feature several differences making it specifically for the M1A2 Abrams. Now, the M1A2 Abrams does have a 50 caliber machine gun, as most American tanks do. However, on the A2, it's different compared to that on the standard M1. The standard M1 Abrams and the M1A1 utilized a arm that came out of the copula that was hydraulically or pneumatically adjustable, and you could then fire the gun from inside the vehicle. When the tanks were upgraded to A2, the system was changed to the configuration that you see it here. The gun can still be fired from inside the vehicle, however, there is a lot more differences compared to the mounting. If we notice, the mounting, rather than a single arm, is a standard style yoke with a Y apparatus that comes off the, the copula itself. The gun can still pivot in its mount and can also be elevated and depressed. On the rear portion of the gun is really where things start changing compared to your standard M2. As you can see, rather than the traditional spade grips, for the M1A2, the 50 has a unique bicycle style handlebar system, and the trigger is this large lever over here, which is very easy to actuate. If we notice, there's also a channel cut through, so you could still see the sights. The trigger mechanism sits on top of a solenoid, which gets fitted to the buffer tube spring on the M2HB. On the opposite side, we have here the charging handle, which is standard for the M2, and that's how you charge the weapon. And on the reverse side, there is a box structure with a small chain and wire on it. And this, I believe, is to charge the weapon from inside the vehicle without having to expose yourself. Now, the stock Henlong machine gun was very basic, as most people know. The barrel shroud and barrel found on the stock M2 were very poor and very soft in detailing. And on this model here, I went ahead and swapped out the stock configuration with the, the detail set from Aber. The Aber set, just like I mentioned in the jumbo video, consists of a CNC brass barrel shroud and brass barrel, as well as other photo wedge details which are found on the M2. Now that set is really designed for use on the Tamiya M2HB, however it is also a great drop-in installation that really helps the look of the Henlong unit. Now because of the elaborate bicycle setup in the back, the Aber set that contained all of the butterfly and spade grip components was not utilized for this build and went to the spare parts. Another quirk that this kit gun had was that on the yoke here, I don't know if it's like this on all Henlong models, but on this one, there was only enough room for one of the mounts for the M2 carriage. The carriage was short on the opposite side. I don't know if it was molded partially or if that's just the way Hemlong did it. Either way, it was incorrect and is very difficult to mount the gun in this manner. To improve it, I went ahead and fabricated the missing section of cradle and blended it into the Hemlong yoke. As you can see, the cradle is seamless and you can't see where the replacement component was added. To mount the gun to the cradle, the plastic nub was deleted and a brass micro fastener and nut were used in place. The gun simply then just mounts directly to the Henlong turret. The ammo box and ammunition that you see here is stock Henlong and no mods were made. The ammunition was simply painted and so were the links. Moving to the loader's machine gun, on the M1 Abrams, the loader has a 7.62 M240 machine gun. The gun that you see here is the kit supply version and was modified just like the 50 to improve its detail.
To improve the M240, I drilled out the barrel end of the machine gun. And for the rear portion of the gun, I fabricated the missing handlebar mechanism, which is found on the rear. Also added was the firing solenoid cable, which you can see mounted in this position. Now, the gun itself, unlike the 50, cannot elevate or depress and is static in this position here. This lends itself for being a little problematic for the loader's hatch. If you notice before, when I opened up the loader's hatch, the gun was not present. This is because with the model gun mounted, you cannot open the hatch because you'll strike the machine gun. Obviously, on the real tank, this is not an issue as the gun can swivel out of the way. So when it comes time to turning on the loaders, the switch for the airsoft gun, or if you want to display the hatch in the open position, you simply pop the gun off, and you now have access to the hatch to open it, close it, and do what you need to do. Moving on to the paint, weathering, and markings. The markings that you see on this model here are all applied via paint and stencils. No decals of any sort were utilized on this build. As for the coloring, the customer requested to have the tank in an all yellow configuration that looks like what it came out of Anison Army Depot. If we can see the weathering on this tank is very mild compared to my other builds. This is again as per request for the customer. He didn't want to have the tank look like that it was in fuel for very, very long, which is why this model here is absent my usual weathering cues of power fouling on the machine guns the barrel, as well as even gas type staining. As for the one of the more eye-catching features on this build, which is that of the mix and match components, if anyone looks up pictures of the Anison Army Depot, you will see a lot of the tanks that come out of the factory do have mix match parts. More than likely this is due that when they're assembling the parts, they have all of the parts in bins from different lots. Some lots, the parts are still left over in their NATO green configuration, even though most of the tanks leaving these days are in the desert tan coloring. It's not uncommon to see tanks with the mix and match parts that you have here, namely parts like the row wheels, side skirts, and even the bore evacuator. By adding these separate parts really helps make the tank pop compared to its standard all tan configuration. Well, here we are in my usual test track area to test the tank. Now, like I said before, the tank is fully radio controlled. And like I said before, under the hood, the tank is 100% stock. No additions or changes were made to any of the tank's functions. Now, before anyone asks, no, the tank cannot go 44 miles an hour and it cannot go a simulated 44 miles an hour. The reason for that is that the tank utilizes the same gearbox found on the other Henlong models, namely that of the Sherman and the Tiger One. The gearbox is all metal, however the ratio is that where it cannot pick up really a whole lot of speed. In addition to the speed, the tank sound system is also another part where Henlong kind of slipped up. For the sound card that this tank has built in, it is that of your standard Henlong sound card, which for a tank like a Pershing or a Sherman or even a Tiger, works okay. However, for a tank like the Abrams, which has a jet turbine engine, not so much. Now, it is possible to change out all of these components with that of an L-Mod or even some of the higher ratio gearboxes, which I believe are found on IMEX's website. However, for the purposes of this build, the customer did not care to swap all that, any of that out, and the stock configuration works for his needs. I will say that the tank does perform pretty well in that it's reliable and it doesn't have any serious mechanical issues like throwing a track or something along those lines. However, I will say that this tank here did need a replacement radio. The original radio that came with the model for some reason just KO'd and stopped working. The radio that you see here was purchased off of eBay. It came in and one thing that's nice about the Henlong unit is that it does have a switchable switch on the inside to calibrate the tank to any 2.4 gigahertz Henlong radio that you may have. You simply turn on the radio, you turn on the tank, you hit a, uh, the button, and within a second or two, the tank is macroed.
A quick edit from what I mentioned before. In the previous scene, I mentioned that the tank's commander's copula is, where is the hopper for that of the BBs. This is actually incorrect. The hopper for the BBs is the loader's hatch. The loader's hatch double acts as the BB hopper, as well as the main kill switch for the airsoft gun. The tank has been loaded with some BBs and I'll be firing it during the test drive. To turn on the tank, just like with all RC tanks, you first turn on the radio. With the radio on, it's now time to turn on the tank. To turn on the tank, there is one switch on the bottom of the tank, like on all Henlon models, that is for the main power. As you see, I went ahead and painted it red so you know when the tank is on. With the tank now powered on, I'll go ahead and start the engine. Just like with all Henlong 2.4 gigahertz radios, that is facilitated with that of the padlock. I'm gonna hit the padlock, which will fire up the engine noise. Spoiler alert, it's gonna be that of your standard piston engine sound card. Just like with the more contemporary releases from Henlong, you have a few options with animations. You have here a volume control. You have here the smoke. Smoke system's on, I'm just gonna let that heat up while I talk. You have here the cannon and the main machine gun. Cannon. And machine gun. Like I said in a previous scene, you, I hollowed out the slits in order to have the flash emit from these locations here, as well as the front, which is more prototypical to the real vehicle. The rest of the functions are as follows. This stick here is purely for drive. Now, if we notice this slider here is just for looks and is non-functional. This slider here actually controls the trim of the tracks. It's important to leave this in the center as the tank will run better that way. If we notice, I went ahead and added a small little red line to keep everything visually in spec. As for this stick here, this stick here is all of the turret functions. Left and right turns the turret. Down raises and lowers the gun, just like on other Henlong models. It runs on a, on a circuit. And going up to the red dot, fires the gun. One bit of the functions that's hard to get on video, specifically in the lighting that I'm shooting in, is that of the smoke system. As you can see, smoke is being emitted from the rear portion of the tank. I will now go ahead and crank up the volume and put some mileage on the tracks. Now it's important to note that this tank here does have throttle control and currently as you can see I'm going at a very slow speed. If I give it a little bit more gas, the speed does improve a little bit. Like I said before, the tank does have an airsoft BB gun mounted to the model, and I will go ahead and test the tank's gun on that target.
And that concludes this model showcase video for this 116 scale American M1A2 Abrams main battle tank. If you like this video, stop by and like us on Facebook. And don't forget to check out EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks for watching.